Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Psalm 90. Psalm 90. Psalm 90. Uh, quick. Quickly, um, the last listing of ideas that was given with regard to new series that people were kind of interested in seeing, the only one I have so far would have been Dangers of Disney. Was that actually like legit? Somebody wanted to hear on that? Oh, okay. Um, the last listing that I had for any ideas for Sunday schools, uh, lessons, or series and such, uh, <coughs> Dangers of Disney. Was that something that, okay, somebody wanted, like legitimately? Okay, and then also, uh, I guess so. <laughs> Bible, Ark, and Geography. Archaeology, Bible, Ark, and Geology, and Geography. Nope. All right, okay. I didn't hear that. <laughs> uh, Bible, Bible, Archaeology, and Geography? No, I heard you say it. Oh. I, just, I didn't hear it in the class. Okay. I have another one if you're looking for it. Four. Okay, well. Um, Sunday school on uh, like what to do when real persecution comes. Oh, okay, that's good. Like local, right here, you know, things that might happen and how a Christian should respond to that to it. Okay, that's really good. I have a if it's. Not corrupted. Uh, I should have a PowerPoint on that already set up that was given to me by a missionary to South America. Um, beyond just whatever I would do with regard to that. Okay, so right. what to do when real persecution comes? <clears throat> was that there was there would have been two more, correct? From no, that was it. Does anybody have any other suggestions? Because for the next two weeks, we're I'm going to do, because uh, I never really finished up. We, I, I said we we're going to cover uh, Judaism and then Islam, as far as what they believe with regard to salvation. And then uh, following that is when I was looking, okay, what well, we can jump into something new. So we'll be examining Judaism and then uh, Islam following. Uh, for the next two weeks. Okay. All right. Uh, so Psalm 90. Psalm 90. It says, uh, I'm going to read it. It says, A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Okay, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Okay, thou turnest man to destruction and sayest, returning children of men for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as asleep in the morning. They are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. And in the evening it is cut down and withereth. Uh, for we are consumed by thine anger and by thy wrath. We are troubled. I good morning, sir. Uh, Psalm 90. We are in Psalm 90. Uh, verse 8. Okay, Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they are fourscore years, yet, it is strength, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Okay, who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So, teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? 
and let her repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants, and thy glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our, uh, of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. And not very long, it's only 17 verses, uh, and starting out, we read that this is in particularly written by Moses, and it's listed as being a prayer of his. So now, knowing prayer that is basically a request, we have, if you were to start at verse 12 down to verse 17, uh, eight particular things that Moses asks of God with regard um, to basically this life. In particular, not just also to Israel, but also uh, to himself. And this is something that we can learn from, uh, seeing as how we're starting a new year. Um, and in part also because of uh, verse 12, it's a good pattern or it's a good uh, uh, schematic as far as which to kind of follow. Uh, there's other portions of scripture we're going to be looking at, but in particular as far as how should we order our life. Okay, we have a, a beginning of a new year, on uh, obviously you know there's a lot of things that uh, maybe we could have done better uh, last year, but uh, since it's a fresh start, uh, we can uh, start off on the right foot. And here Moses is calling out to God. He spends the bulk, or I'd say at least half, of the of of this psalm uh, as listed as being a prayer. And first off, he starts off with basically praising God. Um, first verse, you know, he's been our dwelling place in all generations, and then he acknowledges God's attributes, that uh, he's eternal, and then he's powerful. He compares man to God, or rather God to man, and then, you know, we, <laughs> there's no comparison. And in reality, the fact is God is good, God is great, uh, and, you know, we're, in essence, we're but dust, and our life is fleeting. <clears throat> is the point that he likes to contrast. God's eternal, but our life's fleeting. We are limited um, by time. And even then, we don't have very much of it to begin with. Now, I'm not trying to be depressing, but it's just fact. He states here in um, verse 10, that says that the days of our years are threescore years and ten, if by reason of strength they be fourscore. It says, yet is there sorrow labor, uh, yet is your strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. So regardless if you've been able to live what would be considered a long and full life, or you might be one of, the, you know, one of many that might be cut off uh, as a younger individual um, by our standard, the fact is our life is, uh, as James says, it's, it's but a vapor. Okay, we don't have a lot of time. And comparatively, the fact is, God, since he's not restricted by time, he's not limited by time, he's not um, under his constraints. You know, he, he's, <laughs> he's everlasting. We are, well, our soul is, um, but our physical body is not. Okay, and we're, you know, we have promised, obviously, that we'll have a new body. Um, but nevertheless, the thing is, we're, we're, we're limited, he's not. And so his ask, his, his request of God is that, starting out, he says that, uh, hi, good morning, Psalm, uh, we're in Psalm 90, Psalm 90. He says, of the, uh, of the first of many requests that he asks of God here, he says, uh, teach us to number our days, teach us to number our days. And he gives the express purpose for it, that uh, we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Um, silly question, and again, I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence, but why is that important? What is, uh, you know, why, why is that like relevant or pertinent? Sir? The whole thing just gives me a, 
picture of how brief our life is, and we're created by Him who is eternal. He's given us eternal life in His Son, Jesus Christ. So, like the psalm says, we owe it. How can I do less than give Him our best? We, we need to live for Him and not for ourselves. I think that's the lesson I see in the psalm. That's a good point. That is true. We are created, in, in Ephesians, Paul writes that we, you know, we're, we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Uh, we're his workmanship. Uh, we're his craftsmanship. Uh, in, honestly, most of Paul's writings, when you go through the New Testament, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, uh, again, we just uh, re referenced Ephesians, but then also in Colossians and Philippians, Paul speaks of our works. Uh, when he writes to Timothy and to Titus, uh, that you know we're created under works, and uh, in particular Ephesians four, uh, where he speaks regarding the church. I know this is not the church, but it's still uh, profitable for us, and that is that um, he says he gives some apostles, some prophets, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Uh, now they are given in particular for the perfecting of the saints, and we have a our own personal responsibility to not only allow ourselves to be perfected, but also to seek that. And that is the, the maturing and that growing, to, to be more like Christ, right? That's our that's our call. And then um, he states right after that, he, that he says, for the work of the ministry. And so a lot of people look at it and say, like, okay, so it's pastor, evangelist, teacher that they're, uh, pastor, teacher, evangelist, they're, they're the ones that are given for the work of ministry, but in reality it's all inclusive. In other words, it's the saints are matured so that us in conjunction with those that were given for our maturing co-labor basically in the power of the Holy Spirit with God for the work of ministry. So the work of ministry is a calling to every Christian. Now not every Christian has the same responsibility obviously and he goes into detail in that in 1 Corinthians uh, where, where he speaks of uh, 12, 13, and 14 when, he, when, he, uh, when he's addressing the spiritual gifts. You know, Not everybody's an eye, not everybody's a ear, not everybody's a foot or a hand, so uh, we have our role to fill within the church as given to us by God, since it's His Spirit that is the one that not only enables us, but He's the one, actually the one that uh, is, He gifts us. Uh, so it's God's gifting, God's leading, God's directing, but as we are yielded to Him and we are uh, you know, being responsive and growing, maturing, and then we'll be co-laboring with everybody, so everybody, everybody has, a, everybody is called to ministry, you could say, and everybody has a ministry that God has called them to, uh, and it's up to us to be yielded, uh, allow ourselves to be directed by God, uh, to to be stretched and grow, uh, so that we can see that fulfilled, and that in in that God is going to be glorified, because uh, again, it, uh, obviously, it's not about us, but it's about Christ. So as we're filling our role. Christ is going to be the one that's going to be magnified and seen, and he's drawing all men to himself. Uh, and then the, the, the church thereby is going to be growing. Uh, so uh, that's a good point. But here, here's another factor is that um, of, of a, there's, a, there's a few other, that, that is primary, uh, as you stated, Brother John, uh, because our life is fleeting and, our you know, uh, God's eternal. We only have so much time. But the fact is, God actually wants to do something. God wants to work. Uh, and so, a lot of... Well... <laughs> a lot of people have... Uh, basically, a messed up concept of how they think God operates within a person's life, or even within their own life. Uh, how... How many, how many of you, just uh, again, <laughs> how many of y'all are planners? Like, do you guys take time to set goals and then plan out goals for, say, a month or a week or a year, maybe five year, ten year down the road? And, okay. <laughs> okay. <coughs> and then how many of you guys, like, in those, go back and review and then actually take the time to go ahead and say, hey, you know, uh, Okay, what can I do better? I know a lot of times there's work settings where you do that. You have to do that if you're going to be productive, uh, at, you know, in, in, in any business really. But as far as just your, your personal life, 
where you said, and it, it's not only just limited to spiritual goals, but obviously that would be the important one. But I mean, you have like physical goals, health goals, and relationship goals, and all those kinds of things. Okay. Um, I'll admit this. I hate to say it, but I really admit this. Okay, I I didn't grow up like that. That was not a part of how I was raised, and you know I'm not I'm not proud of that fact or anything like that. It wasn't until I was hit with it, in part with the military, and uh, I was actually instructed when I got to uh, Christian college on not only the importance of it, uh, but also in the military is more done for you. Uh, so if you pay attention, you can pick up on on uh, but you uh, on how you can do that for yourself. Um, but my again, a lot of people live like this: is that they they well, what's it matter? You know, I might I might not even make it. I mean, the Bible even says that our life is but a vapor. You know, and that in James that uh, you should say if God will, uh, because I don't know if I'm going to be here tomorrow or the next day or five years or ten years down the road. So you best get what you can out of life now, all right, so you just, in a, in a sense, basically just like live for today, and you know, who cares about what's ever down the road, I might not be alive then, so take advantage of what you have now, I mean, I, I know it's really foolish, but that's, that's the, th that's the thinking, okay, right? and then, uh, so, so you don't, you don't make any plans, you don't have any kind of goals, or you don't have any kind of direction, you just go ahead and live in life, and just going through, going with the flow, uh, going, going like that, and by and large, that, that's a lot of our culture here in the U.S. Uh, and I don't think that's just limited to uh, the millennial generation and such. Uh, there's a lot of old people that are like that as well. Uh, they didn't take the time to, say, plan out for retirement or to plan out really much of anything for their life. And then when they look back at it on their deathbed, they regret, oh, you know, I wish I would have done this, I wish I would have done that, I wish I would have, you know. And a lot of that could have been accomplished in, in planning. But I, I'm, I don't know that you wouldn't have a person that would have some sort of regret at their deathbed. But uh, in part, the, here's the fallacy that a lot of people have with regard to God. Okay, and since most people view, okay, oh, well, if, well, all people know that God is real. Okay, they all have that. We're told in Romans that uh, he's, he's placed that in our hearts. Okay. He's created us with that innate in knowledge of him. So since, um, you know, God's real, he's the one that's in charge, he basically does whatever he's going to want to do. Uh, you face a crisis in your life, you face some kind of really strong disappointment, and then a lot of times people want to throw up their hands and they get bitter, and they say, well, what's the use of trying to do anything else because it's like God's going to be against me. So <laughs> if... If I put my heart into doing something, or I have, I have, I have some kind of goal to pursue, uh, he's just going to, you know, pull out the rug from under my feet, or just take it away, or give me another heartbreak or disappointment along those lines, and I don't know that I want to handle that, or, I, or that I even can handle that. So what's the use? And they don't anymore. Okay, that might not be how they would verbalize it, but that would be a foundational way of thinking for a lot of people, so they don't. And the reality is, is that, uh, one, God's not looking to destroy life, but he's looking to save it. He's looking to give life and life more abundant. That's why Christ had come originally, right? So God wants to bless. God wants to use. And if we would but submit ourselves to him, if we would but yield ourselves, if we would be obedient, uh, then... It's promised that we will see uh, God work. Okay, it's, it's it's in effect guaranteed from Scripture that God is going to do something in your life. He wants to do something in your life. Now, to what degree uh, and what exactly that comes from you getting in the Word? Um, we'll turn here quickly. Go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11.
we'll start, we'll, 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 we'll read verse 30, 13 and then we'll jump down to 33. Uh, verse 13, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, um, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Uh, verse 14, for they, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, and truly if they have been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. You know, but now they seek a better country that is in heavenly Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Uh, if we were to read back at the beginning of the chapter, it speaks of Enoch, of Abel, of Abraham, and uh, Sarah, uh, of Noah. Uh, and then we jump down to verse 13. It says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, okay, but having seen them afar off. Again this, again, this is speaking uh, with regard to faith. Uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is there's going to be a second category of Christians here. Now, these, again, they weren't perfect, and we, we see that in Scripture when we read their accounts, um, were individuals that, though they may have fallen, they have uh, made uh, wrong, sinful decisions. The fact is they, they did please God. They died with a testimony of having pleased God, and in, in, in effect, you know, God, God was, God was pleased with them, and you know, they could hear, "Well done, thou good and faithful servant," when they entered in. But in their lifetime, they actually never received the promise uh, for which they, they were they were given. Okay, but they did die believing. Uh, go down to verse thirty-three. Well, uh, verse 32, 32. and then what shall I more say? For the time should fail me. Uh, to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah of David also and of Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms wrought righteousness, obtained promises stopped the mouth of lions quenched the violence of fire escaped the edge of the sword uh, out of weakness were made strong waxed valiant in fight turned to flank the armies of the aliens and then women received their dead raised to life again and then now he's going to go into a second category. We'll stop right here just for a moment. Uh, those are some pretty amazing things. Uh, we, if we read about most of the ones that he initially mentioned there in verse 32, that's in the book of Judges, uh, which we covered the uh, early part of last year. And those amazing things that you've seen happen. Uh, you know, quench um, the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword. I, I think of the three Hebrew boys. You got... Um, out of weakness were made strong. That could have been any of the number of individuals we've seen uh, from that time period. Uh, with not, not just within the judges, but Wax Valley and fight turned to fight the armies of the aliens. I think of Gideon there. And then women received their dead raised to life. Uh, that would be not just Elijah, but also Elisha. He performed the same miracle uh, with regard to a widow woman that was taken care of. And they were able to see amazing things happen within their lifetime. Uh, so you could say, okay, God, they were blessed. God blessed them. Um, and then he goes and now elaborates a second category. He says, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. That's interesting. And then others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. Uh, they were stoned. Okay, to death, that it would be. They were sawn asunder. Uh, they were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And here's God's commentary on them. He says, of whom the world was not worthy. Wow. Okay, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all having obtained a good report through faith. What's that say next? Yeah, they didn't receive the promise. They received not the promise. Okay. And then God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made uh, perfect. And then he's going to go on uh, in verse in chapter 12 with regard to, you know, seeing we're encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Uh, let us, you know, run the race with patience, looking at the Jesus. 
So no, this is an example that we should follow. You have two categories of individuals. You have people that actually got to see the promise within their lifetime, and you have other people that it seems like <laughs> they got nothing but really bad things happen to them, you know, and they didn't have anything as far as what God had told them. Hey, this is here's how I'm going to bless you. Here's what I'm going to do for you. Here's my promise to you. And they died not having anything with regard to that, you know. And actually, it seems like they died miserable deaths. They were sawn asunder, you know, wants to be cut in half. Uh, somebody was stoned, pounded with heavy rocks till they die. Um, they were slain with a sword, you know, wants to go out like that. You know, violent, violent, violent death. Nobody. You know, who, <laughs> who here wants to volunteer for that? I'll be honest with you, I don't, I don't, I don't look forward to that. I mean, if God called that for me, you know, I'd, I'd have to have his grace for it, but the fact is, I don't, you know, I don't really... If the Lord doesn't return in my lifetime and I have to go through deaths, I would like for, you know, personally, I'm just saying, I would like for it to be peaceful. You know, go in my sleep or just just something quick, painless. You know, I don't really have a high pain tolerance, high pain quotient. Uh, but, you know, if, if God had something different for me, that, you know, I'd be fine. Uh, he'll give grace for that. But that's not something that people look forward to, like, yeah, that's God's blessing. This is awesome. This is amazing, right? Uh, but God said of them uh, that the world was not worthy of them. Okay, so he had, it, it seems almost like he had a higher esteem, even though he's not a respecter of persons. Uh, for somebody that, you know, they would die in faith, not having received anything, uh, and going out the way they did, uh, than for somebody who did. But nevertheless, they both, both categories are people that died in faith. Okay, now the reason why I'm bringing that up with regard to uh, redeeming our time and then asking God uh, to teach us the number of our days, we may not be of those that actually get to see in our lifetime. You know, I don't, he doesn't, as far as I can tell, he doesn't give any kind of determiner as to who or how, you know, he chooses that or how you might, you know, yeah, I'd like to be category A, the ones that get to see that stuff happen in your lifetime, rather than means that rather than be the ones that category B that have to, you know, in a sense, you know, die a miserable death, or you know, and live miserably, uh, being tortured and persecuted and such. But you can go to your grave, and you can stand before God, you know, as one that He can say, "Well done," and be pleasing to Him, and you know be able to receive great blessing uh, standing before him, even though that in your lifetime, in this short amount of time. Uh, and that's it's obviously done by faith. Uh, go back to Psalm 90. Psalm 90. So God wants to do something. He may not do it within our life, but we can be pleasing unto him and we can receive a uh, great blessing of God. Uh, even though it might not be in our life, uh, if we would but uh, operate on the basis of faith than just uh, living our lives by sight. And that doesn't in any way diminish or uh, do away with our responsibility to plan out or uh, have some kind of organized structure to our life so that we would prioritize. I mean, obviously, that we, we have to have you know things that we do physically and, and that kind of thing, but uh, as we prioritize our life uh, around the spiritual, around that which pleases God. Charlie? Yes? Sir. That verse 90, 12 is a personal favorite. And, uh, so teach us the number of days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. What you're talking about, uh, I label it as an eternity planner because we are planning, you know, as you're saying, for here, for daily stuff. But if you apply the eternity planner to that verse, it puts things in a different perspective. Our days really are short here. And we have to keep looking to God every day, whether it be in His Word, devotion, whatever that may be, to gain wisdom. Um, but looking ahead to, to that time when we're gone to planet Earth. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, Doc? Well, okay, for those of you that weren't at men's retreat, Dr. Comfort, um, he, has, he has a saying, he has many sayings, little piety sayings and stuff like that that he gives in his sermons and stuff. 
but he, he there's one particular kind of sticks is that he says there's two days every Christian should have on their calendar. Um, you know, obviously, uh, today's the day of the salvation, t today and then that day. And that day referring to as far as the day that I stand before God. So everything should be viewed in light of that or planned with regard to, to that, you know, being the case. Hi, good morning. Sorry. We're in uh, Psalm 90. Psalm 90. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, he, does, he doesn't state, he doesn't, that, that's his main request here that he puts forth as ours, teach us a number of our days. But there's a few other things that he mentions here that I think are also quite pertinent to us, even though you know, we're in a different dispensation, different age. Um, he asks God here, verse 14, says, Satisfy us early with thy mercy. Uh, and he gives reason that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. And then <clears throat> verse 15 and 16, I think, are kind of an elaboration on that. Because uh, he says, Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil, and then let thy work appear unto thy servants, and thy glory unto their children. Okay, so satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. So you want God, in a sense, he's asking for a token, um, a, a, a token of God's goodness to uh, satisfy us early with thy mercy. Now, is God merciful? How do we know that? I'm still alive. Amen, yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's constantly reiterated in the scripture if we go through, not, well, you see it a lot in the Psalms. You know, uh, you know the Lord is good. Uh, he's merciful. Um, but we also see it, I mean, if you if we were to sit down and be, be honest as far as we can see how often he's been merciful to us, as you stated, you know, we're still alive. We could go on from there as far as that's concerned uh, with regard to all the things that he's done and showing us his mercy. Uh, but we should have an awareness. A lot of times we find ourselves being disgruntled or getting into a bad attitude and that kind of thing because we lose sight of the fact as far as, wow, God is really good or how good God has been. Um, you know, we face some kind of uh, trial or we there's some kind of disappointment uh, and we're quick to want to blame God. And, and you know, the fact is, He's, he's good. He's always good. Uh, and so we a lot of times we lose sight of that. But he asks, okay, Lord, satisfy us. Oh, uh, oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy. And then verse 16, this is kind of interesting. It says, like, uh, or verse 17. Uh, Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. And then establish now the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. Uh, make, in a sense, it says, in a, let our work be effective. You know, who doesn't want that? I mean, who wants to go into, <laughs> even just on a physical realm, who, who likes to go into work and then have it, you know, just be for nothing, just like empty labor? There's like no point to it. Uh, you know, um, Okay, I, uh, I remember when I was in station in Hawaii in the military. There was a sense where, because we're working on like, well, it's probably almost 40 years old now, 16. Yeah, uh, at the time it would have been like 30, 30 plus year old aircraft that we had to keep running in order. Uh, I was in a training unit, so then we had to just keep the aircraft running so that the pilots would be trained before they get sent out to a different unit uh, where they would actually go ahead and. Uh, do uh, tours. Uh, usually, since we were in Pacific Theater, so they'd go out and they'd be able to go out to Japan, Thailand, Korea, or South Korea, and then uh, Australia, and then uh, some of the other Pacific Islands, uh, like Fiji and such. Uh, but uh, they weren't able to go ahead and do that unless they were properly trained and they passed the, the training course and such. So. Um, our job was just basically keep the aircraft running so that they would be able to get their flight hours in so that they would pass their training and then they'd go ahead and go from there to graduate to whatever other unit they were going to go to and then, you know, run their missions and deploy and all that kind of stuff. So um, it seems kind of like pointless in a sense because it's a, a lot of it's the same thing. Um, you don't, 
if you're good with your preventative maintenance, quite, quite often you don't have to do as much corrective, even though you do, you know, especially with uh, 30 plus year old vehicles, uh, you do have a lot of correction that you have to do. And then since we, our hangars were all located off a of bay uh, it, on an island, it's, you're gonna have a lot of corrosion issues. Uh, even, even if you put them inside, regardless, you have a lot of, you know, the heavy salt. Uh, not just from water, obviously, but like in the air as well. Uh, that does a lot, a lot with mechanical parts uh, with regard to corrosion. So it's, it's, you come in to the military, and especially a lot of guys that go to America, they're, you know, that they want to think, okay, we're doing some great important things, so they want to go ahead and, um, to some degree, some of the guys in aviation, but you see this more with the grunts, with the infantry guys. Because so they want to go out and they want to kill bad guys, right? Well, who doesn't? And then you have as well, okay, the inf uh, uh, usually the more technical job guys are a little bit more laid back. Uh, so it's a little different mentality. Uh, it, it's more like work, but still the fact is you go into work and then you want to feel like, okay, you're doing something that has some kind of greater, higher purpose than just coming in and just like, okay, well, it's the same thing I'm doing that I'm on this uh, uh, maintenance schedule uh, that they put on, okay, so I've got, I gotta scrub this so that uh, you know you don't have heavy corrosion build up, and then I gotta run this test on this piece of machinery, and then I gotta go ahead and, you know, and it's kinda like, okay, wow, <coughs> same thing over and over and over <coughs> and over again, in a sense. Uh, and then you're just kinda waiting around like, wow, okay, wow, this is really, like, you know, you think to yourself, okay, wow, this is really defending freedom, how does this play into it? But the fact is, those things are important because down the road, you know, when it kind of comes for actual use of the machinery or uh, something comes up where you have that uh, you're, in, you're in play with regard to the, the greater mission, if you haven't done those things uh, leading up to that, then you're going to be, you know, you have defective machinery, you're not going to be able to go ahead and run operation. You might have somebody that get hurt or killed. Uh, we never had that. Thankfully, as far as with regard to any uh, safety issues, we had one unit uh, neighboring us that a guy inexperienced and he was um, filling, uh, which he overfilled. He, he was filling one of the landing gear, on, front landing gear on the aircraft. Uh, it overpressurized it, blew it. It caught, basically caused an explosion, and then what ended up happening is it came down on him, uh, so it broke his hip. Uh, but he he didn't die. He survived. You know, but he was crippled, kind of for life. For that at that point, he can still walk, but he's you know he's gonna be on a walker and such. And so he would eventually get like a medical discharge. Uh, what's the point with all that? Oh, um, time comes into play where you have to go ahead and perform mission and such. Uh, you're not gonna be ready. You're not gonna be prepared unless you've done what seems like those daily tedious things that are, you know. In our minds, unimportant, or you know, how does this play in? Okay, um, but you—that's what you need to do. And okay, uh, establish now the work of our hands, or make our work to be effective, to be prosperous. Okay, that's going to come about as we are daily uh, doing what seems like that monotonous, tedious. Uh, work, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm not always desirous. I hate to say this. Of okay, wanting to get up and then to read or to study, but it's necessary uh, for me if I'm going to uh, if I'm going to grow, if I'm going to hear from God, if I'm going to learn anything, if I'm going to be in any way uh, productive. I remember. Well, this, this isn't just limited to that time, but I remember uh, at first, when I first became a Christian, I had an easier time praying than I had uh, reading the Word of God and studying. And what challenged me on that was, beyond just a conviction of the Holy Spirit and preaching, was that I found that the times that I would get into the Word of God on my own, and I made that personal initiative, beyond just learning and growing and having God you know, show me things and teach me things, was more often than not was... I'd be reading something, it's like, oh, that's interesting. 
And then within like a day or two, I'd be challenged by somebody either at work or uh, if I was, uh, we would do our soul winning on Saturday mornings there at, in, at my church in Hawaii. So we'd be going door to door, you know, inviting people out, trying to witness to them. Uh, Tuesday nights I had a friend of mine that would like to go out. Uh, there was a mall not very far from where the base was at, so then we'd go over there and then just uh, be kind of like in a common area, walk around, passing out tracks, trying to uh, talk to people. Or sometimes on Friday nights we'd go to Waikiki and then talk to, you know, try and talk to whoever passerby were. But more often than not, I'd be challenged with something and it'd be like, okay, wow. It was, if I wasn't in the Word of God, uh, I wouldn't have had a response to be able to address whatever question or whatever challenge they had. And it wasn't because, oh, I'm some great, smart, intelligent person, but it was because, okay, that was God's, leading God's directing, and that, that's how he was preparing me for what was to be ahead. And you wouldn't have had that if you hadn't taken the time to, whatever, to go ahead and be diligent. And so, let, establish all the hands, uh, establish all uh, the work of our hands. God, let our work be effective. Uh, and obviously, this should be a desire of ours. Uh, I wouldn't think any, you know, uh, red-blooded male or even female for that matter would want to, you know, have just work to be fruitless. Uh, we all have a desire for that. So Moses' request: teach us to number our days, satisfy us early with Thy mercy, and then uh, establish out the work of our hands. Establish out the work of our hands. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Uh, next week, we're going to be looking at uh, Judaism and then not just what they believe, uh, but also how to go ahead and uh, respond to Jewish individuals with regard to, uh, well, in particular, we're going to be looking at salvation, uh, but there's other aspects as well. And then, uh, which we'll see that modern Judaism differs from what God had instituted in Leviticus scripturally. And in week following we're going to be looking at the same thing as far as Islam. It's a, Islam was never instituted by God. Uh, so that would be the only major distinction. But we'll be looking at as far as what they believe with regard to salvation. Alright. No questions? Alright. We're dismissed.